Hey, please help me welcome our speaker for the morning, <coughs> Dr. Matthew Graham, <coughs> research professor in astrophysics at Caltech and project scientist for the Zwicky Transient Facility. He has previously worked on the Catalina Real-Time Transient Survey and the Palomar Quest Digital Sky Survey. Dr. Graham has written that his main interests are the application <clears throat> of machine learning and advanced statistical methodologies to deal with the unprecedented volumes of data that the 21st century astronomy is generating, CTF being case in point. He lists among his major research concerns, gravitational lenses, supermassive black hole binaries, and quasar variability. Matthew Graham received his bachelor's degree in 1993 from Trinity College, Oxford, and completed his PhD in 1996 <clears throat> at the University of Central Lan Lancaster. Cashin. I'm from Massachusetts. People had problems with like Worcester and things like Lancaster is the closest I could come. Uh, after five years working at Imperial College London, he joined the research staff at Caltech in 2003 in the position of senior computational scientist. Present, Dr. Graham is an author on more than 140 refereed papers and conference proceedings. Professor Matthew Graham, welcome to the Greenway Talks online at Palomar Observatory and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation. So for now, I'll ask everyone to turn off their microphones. And with that, Dr. Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm very pleased to be able to be here to talk. Let me just share my screen and I can start this presentation. Can you all see my opening slide? Good, good. Yes. So yes, um, as you said in my intro, um, a lot of what I, I'm interested in from a research perspective is the application of what the uh, the the press, popular press would call artificial intelligence to solving astronomy problems with the, the, the volumes of data that we're facing. Um, however, I think one of the unique things about uh, ZTF, the Swiki Transient Facility, is this actually is a 21st century that's uh, uh, survey that's very much done on a 20th century telescope. And I'll talk a bit about that in, in a minute. Um, as you said, I'm the project scientist and one of the co-PIs for ZTF. Um, my fellow, the, uh, our PI is, of course, Professor Sri Kulkarni here from Caltech and former director of the, uh, the observatory at Palomar. Um, my co-PIs are Professor Tom Prince and Professor Mansi Casleywell here at Caltech, and then uh, Professor George Hulu, who is the director of IPAC, which is the uh, NASA Infrared um, Data Center, which is part of Caltech or which Caltech ministers. And then we have um, Eric Bellum, who's our survey scientist at the University of Washington. Rich DeCaney looks after our interactions between Caltech and um, Palomar Observatory. Dave Shoup at IPAC is our data systems lead. Um, Ashish Marbal is a research scientist here at Caltech. He's leading our machine learning group. And Roger Smith is our lead camera engineer and probably the person on day-to-day -day operations who we really could not do without when we have problems with the telescope. So some of you may be familiar with him. There are many more people in ZTF, both at Caltech, and um, I'll st start from the outset that ZTF is a, is a very interesting structured project because we are part funded by the National Science Foundation and we are part funded by um, a private 
partnership of uh, nine or 10 institutes around the world. And you can see the logos of those various institutes at, at the bottom. So within the US, we have the University of Maryland um, and um, the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Then we have Trinity College, Dublin, um, one of the national labs in France, the University of Humboldt in Germany, um, the University of Stockholm in Sweden, the Weizmann Institute in Israel, and um, a grouping of universities in Taiwan. And they're, they're all partners in the, in the ZTF partnership and contribute uh, funds to help us run this overall endeavor. Um, and this, this split has um, some implications in the way we operate, which I'll, I'll cover um, later on. So um, ZTF is actually um, the main component of what we like to refer to as the Palomar time domain astronomy system, in the sense that we make use of the three telescopes that are in Palomar already, um, and probably the, the winter telescope, the new uh, one meter infrared survey telescope that's coming online this year and is being installed at the moment, will also sort of fit into this. So the P48 is our main discovery engine. Then we use the P60 as well. So both the 48 inch and the 60 inch are dedicated to the overall ZTF project. Um, but we use the, the 60 inch for follow up. And then we have um, reasonable chunks of time on the 200 inch um, for doing classification um, of things that we find interesting. And when the 200 inch isn't good enough, we go to Keck um, and you know, use a telescope that's twice the size, and that's as good as we can get on the ground at the moment. But um, these are all, all three telescopes are very important to, to ZTF and to, and to the work we do. So the 48 inch, as, as some of you may be aware, is actually a very old telescope comparatively. It's, you know, over 70 years. Um, and back in 1950, when it, first saw first light. Um, the fastest car in the world, or one of the fastest was this Bugatti 100, I think it is, which had a top speed of maybe 150 miles an hour. And um, here we are 70 years later, and Bugatti are still one of, or still the fastest car in the world. And um, the speed in terms of uh, the, the speed record has doubled by a factor of two in 70 years, as far as um, cars have could be concerned. However, for um, something of a similar vintage, we've improved through um, digital cameras and modern electronics, the surveying speed of the 48 inch by a factor of almost 1400. In terms of back in the day, in the 50s when Sicky was there, you would put a photographic plate in and expose it and then move on and move on. Now, these days we have a camera instead and we can get the same depth of sky on a much shorter period of time. So um, we're using a very old telescope to do something very modern. And so that's why I think it's this very interesting mix of old technology um, and modern techniques, which allow us to do a lot. So this is a, a schematic overview of the 48 inch telescope tube. Um, you can see, don't think I have, maybe I have a cursor, yes. You can see the mirror here at the left end, and we have an electronics rack then bolted onto the outside of the tube, which provides most of um, the sort of um, important stuff for the, um, the camera and for the instrument in support. We have um, a little filter storage closet bolted onto the side of the tube then as well, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. This is where the camera actually sits in the main beam. Um, we have a robotic arm that sits in there for doing our filter exchanges. And then we have a mechanical shutter at the end, uh, which is probably the size of a small table tennis table and opens and closes in about uh, half a second. Um, and various baffling and all sorts of other stuff in there to make sure that we can avoid all the glints of metal and glass and such. So ZTF is this, this camera in the middle. And this is actually um, a shot up from the mirror. So here's the camera sitting in place. Here's the shutter at the end. And you can see the camera is made up of 16 CCDs. 
Now, let me show you. So this is a video of our robotic arm, which is our filter exchanger. So what we actually have is we have three filters on TTF, um, a G, an R, and an I. And they sit in a cabinet, as I said, which is sort of tacked, tucked down on the side. And what happens when we want to change filter, we move the telescope into a, a safe position um, and engage the robotic arm. And it will then go into the um, closet, pull out um, a filter, move it back into place. And on the uh, camera itself, you may see that there are three electronic latches, and then there are at least two mechanical latches on. Um, the uh, robot arm will only disengage a filter when the um, electronic latches have indicated that it's safe to do so. Because obviously Southern California is an earthquake zone and people get nervous with robotic arms moving bits of metal and glass over a very large bit of glass um, in such a situation. And so that's why one of the reasons we also change at a, a safe stove position where if anything does go wrong, it's very unlikely to fall onto the primary mirror. So it's not as though we, I mean, in theory, we could do this anywhere on the sky, but for safety reasons, we, we keep it down at low. So this is one of our filter exchanges. And this happens automatically during the course of a night. Um, it takes maybe the whole operation of slowing, slewing to a safe position and changing the filter and then slewing back to a, a next observation it takes maybe about three minutes. So we try and minimize the number of times we have to do that in any given um, night. Um, and so we have um, scheduling, um, which sort of optimizes the, to minimize the number of filter exchanges we need to do. But uh, this is how we get away with, without having a huge filter view for something for a telescope, which actually has a very um, large field of view. So again, these are our three filters. Um, they cover pretty much the optical um, spectrum, um, G, R, and I. Now, uh, the G and the R are used universally, but the I filter was provided by the ZTF partnership. So um, they are the only group who can actually use that for observations of the night sky. Um, so that's one of the ways in which we sort of operate a little interestingly with this sort of uh, split personality where we are both a private survey and a public survey. 50% um, currently of our observing time actually goes to a, a two night survey of the night sky. So we cover the whole uh, visible sky from Palomar every two nights in GNR filters. But then we have 30% dedicated to partnership time, which goes to more of the spoke programs a uh, higher cadence coverage of certain regions of sky, and also um, uh, maybe, um, and the use of the eye filter. And then Caltech has a 20% share of the time for doing its own uh, particular programs. So this is the field of view of ZTF, 47 square degrees. So this is, this is where we, we really do extremely well. Um, there are a couple of other, um, big sky surveys, which are shown for comparison. Um, the Hyper Supreme camera on the Subaru eight meter from in Hawaii is 1.7 square degrees. Uh, the dark energy survey, the four meter um, down in Chile is two and a half square degrees. The Palomar Transient Factory, which was the precursor survey to ZTF um, on, the, um, on the 48 inch was only 7.3 square degrees. So with our 47 square degrees, we are covering the full field of view of that Schmidt telescope. That's possible. So it's going much more back to the sort of photographic plate coverage you had um, back in Siku's day. Um, PS1 is a similar size, uh, one and a half meter, two meter telescope in Hawaii. And then of course, LSST uh, or the Rubin Observatory camera um, which will have an almost 10 square degree field of view, um, which you'll hear about um, in two weeks time. So we're actually, um, um, in terms of sky coverage, um, about a factor of five larger than LSST. But obviously they're gonna be a six and a half meter telescope and we're in a one and a half meter telescope. So they go much deeper. Um, ZTF saw first light um, in October, 2017. Um, and this is two of the snapshots from our um, 
first light image of, of the Orion Nebula. Um, and this is our actual, this is the full first light image. And this just gives you some idea of what 47 square degrees looks like on the sky. Um, it's about 6,000 by 6,000 pixels. And we would need 91 ultra high def monitors to display this at full resolution. So if we wanted to do a full video wall for each image at full resolution, that's what we would need, you know, happily sitting there. Whereas we're actually all working on our laptops and looking at much reduced renderings or, or much, much smaller areas of interest, obviously. Um, so it's about 650 million pixels there. So not, you know, there are bigger cameras out there. Um, it's one arc second pixels um, and our um, image quality is typically about um, two arc seconds. Um, so, um, that's well tuned to what the sort of mean seeing with the large field of view and all the effects that that can come in at a site like Palomar. Um, the, the Rubin Observatory is close to, it's what, eight and a half thousand feet up, I think, in Chile. Um, and they have a slightly more stable site and a drier site. And so they're going to have better seeing. That's one of the reasons why they have um, smaller pixels as well as being a larger telescope. But I think we do very well for a site that's two hours outside of LA at five and a half thousand feet with a 50, you know, 70 year old camera, uh, 70 year old telescope rod. So um, obviously um, Palomar is an interesting site. Um, so this is, um, as I said, we started, uh, we had first light in October, 2017, but we started science operations properly um, in March, 2018. So we've been going for just over three years. So this sort of shows um, a summary of, of what was, what we've done in um, up until the end of last year. Um, we typically do 30 second exposures. And a 30 second exposure will take us to 20.5 um, magnitude, uh, five sigma depth, 20.6, 20.7, depending if it's G or R filter. But it's around that is where our sort of um, five sigma limit is for detecting sources. Um, and then we have a 10 second window to read out the camera and to slew to the next position. So we can effectively do one observation every 40 seconds. Um, with um, a 47 square degree field of view, that means we can survey about 3,800 square degrees an hour, down to 20.5 in a, you know, and we can switch filters um, for, for, for whatever. So that means that um, on a typical night, so last night, for example, we took uh, 530 observations, I think something like that. So we all alternate between sort of roughly 600 um, in the summer to over 1,000, 1,100 in the depth of winter observations per night. Um, and um, in our first three years, we had a 40, 40, 20 split between the public partnership and um, Caltech time. As of the start of 21, that's now 50, 30, 20 um, because of a, a change in our NSF funding. But, um, We've been on sky for, you know, I think maybe 80% of the time, maybe even longer, um, particularly through COVID. This is one of the advantages of a fully robotic telescope. We don't actually need humans in the loop, except maybe to turn things on. And um, the data flows from, uh, it goes over the microwave link from Palomar Observatory down to San Diego, and then up to IPAC and all the data processing happens at IPAC. And um, in our observations, we have uh, three pipelines that are run at IPAC. There's um, a basic, so an image comes in, um, it's the, the usual, you know, flat fielding, all sorts of things like that happen. And then a source detection algorithm is run over that image. Um, and that produces what we call a single epoch catalog. So that's 
you know, the, the photometry and astrometry of everything that's in that image, um, that 47 square degree image um, at that particular time, and that gets stored in a database. Um, that image is then processed for looking for real time changes. Um, and I'll say, I have more to say about that in, in a few minutes. Um, and it also then goes through a moving object pipeline um, because obviously with such a large field of view, um, we get all sorts of things streaking across whether they're man-made or not. Um, and anything that looks interesting from the moving object pipeline gets reported to the Minor Planet Center um, in real time um, to see whether it's new or, or you know, it's already a known object and we're just adding another data point to the, to the um, orbits. Um, so whether the weather is probably our biggest um, hurdle or biggest reason for not observing. Um, we've actually, from an engineering perspective, been remarkably stable, um, which I think is a testament to um, Caltech Optical Observatories and, and Palomar Observatory. Um, the biggest problem we had was actually in 2018 when we had a cryo cooler leak. Um, and you can see what that <laughs> looks like. We had oil getting into our coolant system. And so we had to bring the camera, take it off the uh, telescope, bring it back to campus and various things getting cleaned out and flushed out and, and baked off and things like that. So we lost about three weeks then. But since then, the camera has remained on the telescope and we haven't had to do anything major. Um, we have contingency that we might have to um, in the next two years um, because we're currently running until September, 2023 under our existing funding. Um, but the hope is that we're not going to have to do that. Um, weather, of course, is, is really interesting and weather these days is particularly interesting. So last year, for example, we had the driest February on record, which was unexpected because we'd normally expect February to, be, to one of, be one of the wettest months. And so we would not have much data then. And then that was followed by the wettest March in 25 years. So um, the standard predictions of when we may be getting good observing or not get observing due to weather seem to uh, not be holding so much these days. But as I say, we, we've been doing very well. Um, now, let me talk about that alert, um, that, that um, pipeline where we um, look for things that have changed. This is probably the, one of the areas where we are most um, visible because we put out um, an alert stream every night of things that we've seen change. So what happens is we take the observation, the science observation we've just taken, um, we have um, reference or template images of every position on the sky, and we pull out the appropriate one for where we've just been pointing, and we take one away from the other to create what we call a difference image. And we then run a source extraction algorithm over that difference image, and anything which is more than a five sigma detection, we say is something that's changed. It's either something that got brighter or something that got fainter. Maybe there's something there now when there wasn't something there before or something that was there before has vanished or something has moved. Um, and those then go through some more filtering um, to, to weed out the stuff that may still be instrumental artifacts or data processing artifacts or whatever. Uh, what's left, we put out as I say, um, as, an, as a real-time alert stream. So there's a binary data format that we use, which encodes this information, and we send it out to the astronomical community. Um, a single image um, will produce about a thousand transient alerts. So if we're taking 500 images on a night, that means we're putting out 500,000 alerts per night. Um, and we average, as I say, somewhere between 500,000 and a million alerts a night. Um, the typical time between an observation being taken and the alert packets from that observation going out is about 30 minutes. So 30 minutes for the data to flow down to IPAC, for them to run their pipelines, for them to do the image detection, um, the transient alert detection and build the packets and send them out. So what we put in these data packets 
is um, we have a, a spatially matched unique name for every alert. And it looks like a bit of a, 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 a telephone directory made up of seven random letters. Oh, well, they're sequential letters, but it means that we're unique. And we use seven because that means we believe that every alert that we can get in a single year will have a unique designation. We have three 63 by 63 pixel images in our alert packets, which show the thumbnail of the thing that we've just observed, a thumbnail of the reference, and a thumbnail of the difference between the two. So you can see what it is that has changed. We also have a rolling 30-day window light curve based on all the observations we've taken of that particular region of sky in the last 30 days, which show upper limits if nothing was detected there and um, G band and R band photometry when not. And then there's a whole load of other metadata that goes in there because we've done some catalog matching to say, this is the nearest source in some other surveys. This is what we believe is the nearest solar system object to your new transient. Um, we have a, a star galaxy score, so we can tell whether we think this is a, you know, a faint star in our galaxy, or maybe this is a, some faint galaxy quite a distance away. And this stuff all goes out. And um, one, of the, one of the major impacts ZTFS has had is in developing the community infrastructure to support this way of doing astronomy. So um, obviously, I mean, if you want, you can happily have 500,000 alerts of, you know, tens of, of 10 gigabytes of data flowing into your desktop every night. But it's much better if there was what we call a broker, an alert broker, which is plugged into that data stream. And I can go to and say, look, I don't want 500,000 or a million alerts a night. What I want are the things that look like supernovae, or that they, they look like asteroids, or they look like, you know, it's, it's a known white dwarf star, but it's doing something interesting because maybe it's a cataclysmic variable going into outburst. And so um, there are five to 10 brokers out there, um, some in the US, some elsewhere. Um, most of them are being developed in advance of the Rubin Observatory and LSST, um, but they've all been working with the DTF to, to figure out actually how to do this. So we're the great stepping stone to, um, to, to LSST. And um, the um, LSST have, have said in the past, you know, we really like ZTF because if they can figure out how to get it to work, great, we know how it works. We don't have to figure that out. If they can figure out what doesn't work, that's also great for us because it means we're not making that mistake. They're going to make it for us first of all. So this is why we've been doing this. So um, as I was saying, our, our first two and a half years, March 17th, 2018 to September 30th, 2020, we had 929 nights and we took data on about 80% of those. That totals about 500,000 exposures. Um, in terms of total sky coverage, that's about 22 million square degrees that we observed. And that is actually as much as LSST will do in its 10-year survey. So we've, we've done the same area coverage as LSST in three years that they will have in 10 years, but obviously they've got more filters and will go deeper. But um, this is one of the areas where, you know, um, they are not just a, a better version of us they are a different version of us. So we have this much wider field of view, which actually means that we have um, much better cadence in terms of observations than Ellis's T will have. We're doing this two night cadence in GNR. And I think with LSST, their wide field survey is typically something like 10 to 15 days in between the same filters. Um, so uh, we have much better sampling of a brighter subset of objects. LSST will go to 24th magnitude, 25th magnitude in a single point, and we go to 20.5. In the, uh, the, the time up to the end of September last year, we sent out 300 million alerts. And six and a half million of those were associated with known um, solar system objects. Um, we were working on six monthly data releases. We're now working on... Um, um, two months data releases, and we've got lots of papers that are obviously flowing out from all this science. Um, 
we are, so ZTF should be considered as about a 10% LSST um, for much less than 10% of the funding. So we reckon that we have about a billion to 2 billion sources overall in our catalogs that we put out. LSST claims sort of 37 billion. Um, and you can see other, other numbers here. So in, in terms of um, nightly alert rate as well, we say about a million and they say they'll be doing about 10 million. Um, so um, the scaling up is only a factor of 10 scaling um, for, for all this stuff that we're doing, which is very good. Um, scheduling actually L um, CTF is uh, a non-trivial problem. And this is work that's been done by Eric Bellum, our survey scientist, um, partly because of this 40%, 40%, 20% split, but also because within each of those times, there are separate programs and some of them need to have a particular cadence. Some of them are, are very time constrained. Some of them, we just sit on an area, the same area of sky for an hour or two hours and do what's called deep drilling, just getting observation after observation after observation, which we can co-add to make deeper. So um, that meant that actually over those three years, we probably had about 90 different survey configurations that um, our scheduler had to figure out who's observing what next and who's getting that time and this sort of thing. Um, as it says, we try and limit the number of filter exchanges because that's quite important because that can take time out. Um, so there were, you know, 4,000 filter exchanges in, in, the, in that 30-month um, block. So that tells you we're looking at, you know, maybe about 10 a night. Um, the other thing, of course, is we also have, we are interruptible for target of opportunity observations. And this was particularly true in the, in the LIGO days. Um, when LIGO is working and looking for gravitational wave events uh, for looking for possible counter, uh, optical counterparts to those. Um, so we can be interrupted and move to an interesting area of sky and just sit there and, and stare at it. And with a wide field of view, we will capture anything that's in that particular region of sky. Um, briefly, the, uh, the 60 inch, as I said, is one of our follow-up telescopes. And what we have on there is a fully robotic, um, low resolution integrated field unit spectrograph. Um, and so we can get um, a, a low res spectrum of anything down to about 19.5 magnitude. Um, and there's, um, it's fully automated. Uh, so the, the you know, thing comes through, results are taken, they're downloaded automatically processed and then automatically reported these days. Um, the main use of the 60 inch is actually in support of a thing called the Bright Transient Survey, which is being run by uh, Christopher Fremling, a postdoc here at Caltech. Um, and um, this is actually one of the main uses of um, a lot of the ZTF time is, is going towards this. Um, and the idea here is to try and create a flux limited spectroscopic classification program of everything, all transients brighter, brighter than 18.5 with the expectation that most of those are gonna be supernovae. So the idea is to really try and clean up on you know, brightish supernovae across the visible sky. Um, and those get reported in real time. The data is public and those go to the transient name server at, at Weizmann in Israel. Um, but as I say, there's a subset which is brighter than 18.5, which uses the, the 60 inch for spectroscopic confirmation. So we're not only saying we think this is a supernova, we get the spectrum to say we know this is a supernova. So um, as of June 2021, um, from the roughly 5,000 extra galactic transients that the Bright Transient Survey has followed up, we know that there are about three and a half thousand supernova 1As in there. Um, and then, you know, a thousand supernova type two, 250 roughly 1Bs. Um, other things creep in as well. We have sort of 23 tidal disruption events. That's when a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole and gets pulled apart and you see flaring. Um, overall, I think in ZTF, we now have about 40. So that'll tell you that, you know, half of them are brighter than 18.5, half of them aren't. And then there are 52 other things in there of supernova type thing, calcium rich supernova or, or dwarf novae or, or fast blue transients or something like that. Um, 
but this is this is really really improving things um of supernovae that are publicly reported and classified ztf is i think at least doing 80 percent of that work worldwide now if not higher so we are dominating the field at the moment um, but obviously that will change in the next couple of years um there's there's so much science that this obviously generates um you know um in terms of solar system discoveries we have a dedicated twilight survey for detecting solar system objects and lots of asteroids have been found some comets have been found interestingly however ztf turns out to be really good at finding kilometer sized asteroids that are within the earth's orbit and these are so-called atira objects and so four of those have been found and then last year we found the first object which is interior to the orbit of venus which is uh, so-called vetera um, again a kilometer sized uh, lump of rock that's happily orbiting the sun about once every 150 160 days um, but constrained to be within the orbit of Venus. And so, um, you know, there may be a population of kilometer sized rocks which are interior to the Earth's orbit going around the sun. Um, this was, I think, somewhat unexpected. Um, we've, I think the smallest thing we've seen was a five meter piece of space debris that passed very close to the Earth. Uh, we obviously find some potentially hazardous objects or near Earth objects. Um, through this survey. Um, and our friends at IPAC are very involved in, in monitoring and detecting those and lead that work. Um, within the galaxy, we have, we have time series in G, R, and I filters for 2 billion stars in our galaxy. And so um, people like Kevin Burge, who's a postdoc now at MIT, have spent their thesis project skimming through these looking for very interesting things um, and one of the things we found very early on was um, uh, ultra compact double degenerate binaries so this is two white dwarf binaries uh, two white dwarfs in a binary system um, and it orbits once every seven seconds ever uh, seven minutes rather not seven seconds every seven minutes and here you can see a speeded up uh, little movie of what it looks like in ZTF, it completely, completely drops out at one point. It just goes faint. And they've used the Keck telescope to try and track it. And I think uh, when it's in that eclipse, it's down at 27, 28 magnitude, it's that faint when it's flipping out. But the thing is, because these are so close and spinning so fast, um, they're actually slowly decaying because of gravitational wave emission. Um, and we've been able to detect this, measure this with going back and getting some PTF data and then looking at what ZTF data is doing. Um, and so this is this is great. And this led to a, a nature paper back in 2019. Kevin has since found more of these systems. I think none as good as this initial one, um, but has doubled the number of, of sources. What's interesting about these sources as well is because they're relatively nearby, they're going to be calibration sources for LISA, which is the space-based uh, gravitational wave detector when that goes up in the mid 2030s. Um, sticking with gravitational waves, of course, um, you know, uh, Nancy Casleywell here at uh, Caltech is, is very involved with, with the EMG, uh, with the electromagnetic follow up of uh, neutron star neutron star mergers, uh, where we expect to see a gravitate, where we expect to see a, an electromagnetic signal. Um, um, but you may be aware that actually there's only been a handful of those uh, types of compact object merger detected, and we've actually only seen one optical signal from one of those, which was back in, uh, which is 1708-17, which was back in August of 2017, the first one. Um, the LIGO-03 run ended um, April last year. And the reports from that are that there were 50 plus black hole black hole mergers, uh, which we typically don't expect to have any visible counterpart. Um, so everyone has spent a large amount of telescope and a large amount of effort in looking for um, black hole neutron star or neutron star neutron star mergers. However, 
Um, because I, uh, one of my strong research interests is supermassive black holes, um, some colleagues of mine um, were thinking about, so what happens with these binary black holes, binary stellar mass black holes, when they merge in a, a rich environment? Or actually, where can they merge? So binary black holes, um, the mergers of those can happen in a number of places. They can be isolated field binaries, just two stars which happen to be at that phase and merge and there's nothing around them. Or it could be because they're in a globular cluster of stars and so there are more encounters to happen. Or as we know, there are stellar nuclear clusters or nuclear stellar clusters um, last year's um, Nobel Prize went for the, you know, the discovery of the supermassive black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, um, and that was identified by tracking stars near to it. Um, so we know that supermassive black holes have um, a cloud of stars around them. We also know that they have a cloud of stellar mass black holes around them. Again, the, the supermassive black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, we believe has a, um, about 10,000 stellar mass black holes around it. So if you've got all of those things spinning around in um, a very deep potential well, which is given by the supermassive black hole, maybe you get an enhanced merger rate in that environment. Um, and it gets even better than that because um, galaxies which have a super, an active supermassive black hole in the middle have an accretion disk of material which is falling in on that supermassive black hole. And that's what we typically call an active galactic nuclei or a quasar. And um, as those stellar mass black holes go through that accretion disk, they actually get pulled into the plane of the accretion disk by, by gas torque. Um, so you, you end up, with what's potentially called a migration trap, that you have a much denser region of stellar mass black holes in the plane of your accretion disk surrounding the supermassive black hole. And so you can get an enhanced merger rate of stellar mass black holes. Now, the interesting thing is, is that this gives you a mechanism for several things. It gives you a mechanism for the most massive super, uh, stellar mass black holes because you're not just gonna have one merger, you'll have one merger and then another merger and then another merger, maybe as often as once every million years. Um, and so you get this, what's called the hierarchical merger scenario. So you can build up more massive stellar mass black holes through a sequence of merging of, of, of less massive black holes. And um, you also are surrounded by gas and dust. So this is not happening in, um, in an empty region of space, it's happening in a very rich region of space. And so it turns out that you can actually come up with some mechanisms whereby you might expect to see an optical counterpart to the merger of two stellar mass black holes. Because what happens is the two, mass black the two stellar mass black holes merge and they get a velocity kick from that merger. And suddenly you have um, an object that is plowing through this very rich gas disk. And so you get a shock front forming, which will heat the gas around it. So the gas gets hotter, it gets brighter. We see a sudden flare coming from um, the accretion disk. Um, and that will obviously die down then once all that gas is burnt away. So we have a physical mechanism whereby we might expect to see um, an optical counterpart to um, a stellar mass black hole merger. The other interesting thing is that because of the, the way the dynamics work, this is not going to be like a neutron star and neutron star merger or a neutron star black hole merger where the expected optical counterpart is a fraction of a second or maybe a few minutes or maybe an hour later than the merger. Uh, because this thing takes time to move through the accretion disk, we might actually expect to see the optical flare a few days or maybe a few weeks after the gravitational wave event has happened and maybe lasting then a month or two. 
So that gives us plenty of time to, to go back and look at all the observations we've taken of that particular region of sky where we may have detected a LIGO event from, and then say, did we see anything? Oh yeah, maybe we did. I wonder if that object could be associated and doing the math to see if that's the case. So this is something we did um, 18 months ago. And um, GW190521 G is um, a very interesting LIGO event. Um, when we uh, were looking for possible counterparts, optical counterparts in known AGN, within the footprint of one of the LIGO mergers. And ZTF is just perfect for this data. I mean, we, we're looking at the sky every two or three nights, so we've got good, good representation. We go to a nice depth, large areas. We can easily cover the LIGO uh, error circles very easily. Um, so this is great. Um, so we found a potential match um, and we thought, well, what else could this be? Well, AGN vary anyhow. And they vary in a random fashion. Does this look like an AGM variation? No, it doesn't. Does this look like a supernova? No. Does this look like a tidal disruption event when one of those stars gets too close to the supermassive black hole and gets pulled apart? No, it doesn't. Okay. Does it look like gravitational microlensing? Is it maybe something that's just lining up with the quasar and giving this sort of peak? No, again, it doesn't. So we ruled out all the obvious normal things that it could be. Um, I mean, there are other exotic things it may have been, in which case it's still interesting, but we don't really know what those look like. So the timing is right, the profile is right, the dynamics are sort of right. And based from what we could see, we said, well, this obviously has to have been a very heavy uh, stellar mass black hole merger. We said the total mass of the system, we reckon is about 150 solar masses, and there has to be high spin on it because it's going to be the result of a hierarchical merger, and the only place you can get that happening is in um, a supermassive black hole. And that's what we found when LIGO came out in September and said, oh, um, GW190521 G was about 150 solar masses, and it looks like to have been the hierarchical whatever. So maybe we've seen the first um, optical counterpart in ZTF to, um, uh, like, to a, a, a stellar mass black hole merger. LIGO 04 starts the end of next year, hopefully. And so obviously we're going to be very interested with their improved sensitivity and looking at every AGN and looking for potential flaring. But this just gives you some of the range um, of, of science that ZTF can do. I haven't talked about neutrinos detected from um, tidal disruption events. I haven't talked about the smallest, most massive white dwarf that has recently been found old planetary systems around white dwarfs, uh, shortest duration gamma ray bursts from a collapsing system. Um, you know, the amount of science that ZTF generates just by doing repeat observations of the night sky with a good modern detector is just incredible. And as I say, most of that data or a large chunk of that data we make available to the community in real time. So we have colleagues in Chile who, um, listen to our event stream and are building a broker system for LSST, um, but they are detecting supernovae that we don't because they've got a slightly different way of identifying this. So I think in summary, ZTF is the first industrial sky survey. Um, there have been sky surveys before, but they haven't been on this very automated, um, you know, this is the pipeline, this is the massive data stream coming down. It is a scientific discovery engine. I think there's no doubt about that. And it's a survey where you're talking not just of handfuls of objects. It's a survey where you're talking about hundreds of this class or thousands of this class or millions of this type um, heading up to a billion. Um, and it's making discoveries right across the board from you know five meter bits of styrofoam or whatever that are just grazing the Earth's atmosphere to to gamma ray bursts and supermassive black holes at the edge of the uh, universe. And I think that one of the most useful things as far as the community is concerned, I mean, even though they're interested in the science that we should produce, obviously, but also it's a very useful proving ground for, for the Rubin Observatory and LSST, which will be a factor of 10, at least um, larger 
which brings its own very, very different set of problems. Um, but there's a lot of common methodology there um, for us to, to work on together. And I think that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. And take Dr. questions. Dr. Graham, thank you very much. It's a wonderful presentation. I'd like to open the floor for questions. Anybody? Uh, I have a question. Um, I'm assuming you're using uh, machine learning uh, to do your classification of events uh, with 500,000 to a million events per night. It's incredible. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that, of how yes. you're doing your classifications? Yes. So um, machine learning actually plays a very important part in a lot of the things we do. And we have um, a variety of different um, points where the machine learning comes in. Um, one of the most obvious one is what we call the real bogus score. Um, so we have, um, we have trained um, a deep learning network to be able to tell whether we think, well, or whether it thinks alert that's coming through, is this a real astrophysical transient or is this junk? Is it bogus? And so every alert we put out has um, that score in it. So um, we don't, you know, we say this is what our system thinks and then people can filter on the basis of that. But we also use machine learning for identifying asteroid streaks for um, the latest thing we've done is to actually be able to spectroscopically classify the supernova that are happening with the bright transient survey. So previously, there would have been someone looking at each of the spectra taken by the SEDM system each morning, or maybe in real time during the night and sending that off. We've now replaced that with some machine learning. Um, and so the, the whole system is pretty automated. The spectrum gets taken, it gets classified, and then it gets reported with that automated classification. Um, we, one of the things that we're trying to do is to actually attach a classification to everything that we've observed, to say this is an RR Lyrae star, this is a quasar, this is a, you know, um, planetary nebula or whatever. Um, and so um, there's been a lot of computation done on figuring out on the best way to statistically characterize all our light curves, all our time series, and then how to translate that into this is a classification for a periodic variable, or this is a classification for a delta scuti star or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I say, so um, there's, there's, there's a lot that goes on um, and um, right across the board from from trying to improve the focus on the 48 inch through machine learning so that it's optimal to, you know, classification of stars to data quality processing, that sort of thing. Uh, what computer Thank languages you. do you use? And <laughs> did, you, did you write the whole package or did, did you assemble it in, out in a heterogeneous manner? So we're, we're very fortunate that, um, the whole data processing pipeline it has been done by IPAC. And um, Python is the, the predominant language that is used. Um, there are some pieces which I think have a C or C++ backing for speed in certain circumstances. But most of what we do is, most of what happens on the processing side is, is Python. On the analysis side, it is virtually all Python. Once we get an image or once we get a, a light curve or a time series or an alert packet, um, our grad students, our postdocs, researchers that are making use of the data around the world are pr pretty much all doing it in Python. Uh, there may be a small subset who are doing it in MATLAB or something like that. But um, it, I think Python is, is just the language of astronomy these days. Um, and is certainly the language of, of the machine learning world. And so I think that's, again, one of the reasons why it sort of interfaces very nicely between the two. So, so it's fast enough to do this kind of real-time processing. 
Yes, I mean, so, so, this, so here's the here's the dichotomy or here's the lie, depending which way you want to argue it. Um, I mean, this sounds like a lot of data, and for astronomy, it is. But for our everyday lives, you know, you stream a movie from Netflix, and that can be four gigabytes, and we're saying, you know, how many people are streaming stuff around the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How much stuff is going on the web, which is real time transactions and this sort of thing. So we, we pale into insignificance in, in, against the commercial uh, online world. Um, but certainly for astronomy, this is a lot of data. Um, and you know, for, for those systems, that's where we need to learn on, on how to do it. But yes, the performance is, is, is perfectly fine. We, we find we don't suffer. Um, in fact, if you want to, w an exercise we have done is that we have taken a Raspberry Pi, you know, one of those hundred dollar little things. Um, and one of our machine learning algorithms, we can run a night's worth of data through that on a Raspberry Pi in about three minutes. So that sort of shows you the power of machine learning and it shows you the power of modern computing and whatever. Um, we are not CPU bound. We're probably more just data IO bound. It's, it's the networking and, and transferring these large amounts of data over rather than the computing itself. That's the issue. Thank you. More respect for my little Raspberry Pi. <laughs> oh, they're great. They're great. They are. Other questions? Other questions? I'll ask one if I might. Um, the FCC has given its approval to SpaceX to launch a fleet yeah. of yeah. 12,000 Starlink satellites with an application for a fleet as large as 30,000 eventually. Um, machine learning and class won't isn't there a risk that ZTF will get overwhelmed by all these false, false alerts? Um, so yes, this is a very interesting question. And Tom Prince, um, one of our co-PIs has actually been very involved with um, some NASA studies on the effect of these um, satellite constellations. It turns out that actually for ZTF, it's not too bad. Um, there's, um, with ZTF, um, I think there's a, a small window each evening where it is problematic currently. And with the, um, you know, if they put some, the right sort of anti-reflective coating or whatever on the satellites, it, it lessens from the ZTF perspective is the first statement. Uh, the second statement is that if we know the orbits of these satellites accurately enough, then you can post-process them out and, and sort of do a lot of um, capturing of that and, and taking them out and maybe using some machine learning on that as well. So for something like ZTF, it is not of that much of a problem. I think um, for LSST, for the Rubin Observatory, it is more of a problem. A, they go that much deeper and um, a, a small glinting satellite, you know, may not be bright enough for us to pick particularly well, but it obviously be much more detectable with their bigger survey. Um, I think there's a longer chunk of night as well um, where they may have problems. And so they may be more overwhelmed. Um, we think of this, however, as an optical problem, but I think actually in the radio, it's a much, much bigger problem. Um, and I think this is what some of the reports that have come out recently have also been saying, have been finding as well, that the, um, the radio communications potentially with all these satellites uh, will be infringing on areas that are astronomically interesting and have traditionally been um, radio quiet as far as earthbound stuff has been done. So I think, um, you know, yes, they are a concern, 
Um, for ZTF, it's it's manageable. LSST, it probably is, but for some of the big radio servers that are planned, I think it, it's it's absolutely terrible as far as they're concerned. Well, we will we will certainly hope certainly hope for the best. Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's a much broader discussion to be had here about how unregulated this is and. Within, for you know, within the U.S., we can regulate to some extent. But what happens when um, um, an entrepreneur in a less regulated country decides to put up their own stuff? And so, you know, it, it, this needs to be handled at a at a very very high level to to ensure that we have future night skies. Well, are there are there other questions? Anyone, please turn on your microphone and join the discussion. I have two, two quick questions. Um, you mentioned that you now have almost the original field of that 48 inch Schmidt camera. Uh, was the yep. original film plates square about the size of your current detector or were they originally round? It's huh. a good question. I think they were originally square. I think actually we have slightly larger than the, um, the original uh, plates that POS used in terms of where we have data, um, but we fill out most of the field of view. Now there is, um, we actually have an aspherical correction plate at the top because um, the, field of, the field of view is not perfectly flat, it curves. And each individual detector on the um, camera is um, arranged in such a way there's, to try and maintain as flat a focal plane as possible. But there are curvature terms with that larger field of view that we have had to take into account when we were constructing things. Yeah, I know a lot of Schmidt cameras had like uh, pressed against a curved surface for the film to maintain a flat field. So yet yeah, you're just positioning the detectors in such a way that sort of neutralizes that? Yes, yeah, that's how it's done with the camera. And second part, what, what temperatures are you running the detectors at? I know as you mentioned cryogenics. Um, I think we typically run them around 100 Kelvin, I think. Um, there's certainly liquid nitrogen going in as the coolant. Thank you. The positioning, is the positioning of the uh, cells on the camera, is that done in real time or? No, it's a fixed. So what we have is um, we actually have fixed positions on the sky that we use. So the so so the uh, the sky has been divided up into two grids um, because there are because of gaps between the the chips. Um, we don't get perfect coverage with a single uh, grid on the sky, um, and so we use grid one, grid two, which gives us about ninety six percent coverage of the sky possible. And um, the pointing of the uh, 48 inch is I think accurate to a couple of arc minutes, um, which is great over that side field of view. Um, so that gives us a little bit of natural dithering, but what it means is that um, when we're scheduling, it's just, oh, okay, the next observation is gonna be field grid 451 in G filter. And so it's done that way. And uh, we don't rotate or anything. That's it's just a very fixed um, pattern. Now, I think LSST has something which is slightly more sophisticated, and that they will be doing more dithering um, for variation. But we don't. We we haven't done that. You said you had funding till or current funding through September twenty twenty three. Yes, I'm sure you anticipate this going beyond this. And do you yes. anticipate a major upgrade at some point? Not significantly. Um, I mean, so we you know, we had an initial, let's see, there was an initial five or six years funding to build the instrument and run the first three years of the survey. And then we've had three years funding from NSF for the, for the second three-year chunk. Um, and we raised the rest of the money from, from, from private um, member institutions. Um, the, the camera is, it, it's very unclear to, to, to us what we could do to improve the camera. Um, mm -hmm. There may be 
different things that we could do with, um, you know, changing the filters out or something like that. Um, you know, there may be more interest in having a, a bluer filter or a, you know, a Z filter or something like that um, in support of, of other work. Um, we are fairly, we're actually fairly boring in the observations that we take in the sense that we typically go 30 second exposure and, and just leave it as that. Um, there has, however, been some recent work done where we can get a continuous readout of the camera. So we have a new observing mode that we're experimenting with. And the idea here is to potentially look for optical counterparts to um, fast radio bursts. Um, and um, in, in that one, okay, you need to find a bright source, but you can, you know, we can take an image once every 10 seconds or something like that and just read it out in real time over that large field of view. So there are potentially things that we can do along those lines, which may be interesting. Um, there's been some speculation about could we do something with an objective prism and get little spectra for everything over that large field of view in, in the way that they used to do with objective prism plates. Um, but uh, yeah, we don't know, maybe. Um, so yes, I mean, our expectation is that there will be a ZTF3, which will go more into the LSST era, because certainly you know, we don't go as faint, but we cover a larger area of sky at a faster cadence. And so there are areas of overlap. Um, LSST, I think, may be observing as high as deck of plus 30. So that and we go down to deck of minus 30. So that gives you a nice broad equatorial strip where they could be going deep, but we're going, you know, and maybe 21, 22 if we stack images as well. There is a range. Uh, where we could be observing at the same time, where we're at a higher cadence and filling in the gaps where they're not getting such high cadence. So stuff like that, that could be potentially very interesting. Um, and also the other thing is of course the winter telescope, uh, which is going to be doing surveying the night sky in the infrared, coterminous observations in the optical with ZTF plus the winter telescope in the infrared in the red would give us a much um, you know, multi-wavelength transient selection, something like that. So I think there are a number of ways that we can we could see going forward um, that don't necessarily require any significant changes to the camera, um, but we may change some of the stuff that we are working with um, in support of that. Does the infrared data from winter intended to go into the same pipeline? that you're using for ZTF? Um, the data reduction pipeline will be different, but the alert distribution, I think we are intending to be pretty much the same. So there is, there is common infrastructure, common data infrastructure that we are intending to use um, for that, um, or that, that it will make use of. And certainly there's going to be um, a lot of people are gonna be going, what did ZTF, uh, observe of this region of sky or this object recently or historically. Neat. And uh, Dave Hightower asked how, how in, the, in the ZTF camera, the Z, ZTF telescope, uh -huh. how, how do you prevent condensation um, on, the, on the cooled uh, Detector surfaces. It's so it's essentially a sealed system. So it's very hard for um, any water to penetrate. Um, in fact, we do have we we sometimes speculate that you know we could still be open when maybe we're not necessarily open because of high humidity measured elsewhere on the mountain, because it's very unlikely to uh, for things to, to to be able to to get into the into the actual system. Um, so yeah, it's not really a it's not really a concern. I think we also have there are parts of the system where there is you know there is dry air blown over as well to, to maintain low humidity where it needs to be maintained. But the actual camera itself condensation hasn't been a problem because it is a sealed system. Well, your your problem isn't going to be just with the camera. It's going to be with the uh, uh, corrector plate on the uh, front of the telescope. 
that, that yeah. that's going to uh, fog over at times. <clears throat> yeah. Um, we don't have that problem. Um, so we must be doing something. I know the only thing we actually do with the corrector plate is that we clean it. We were cleaning it once every quarter, but we want to clean it now once every month because we find actually the one of the bigger problems is just uh, dust collecting on it or pollen grains or something like that, which then manifest as image artifacts. And so that's one of the things we're having to do. Um, well, I, I don't know what they're doing with the uh, uh, 48, but I know with the other telescopes, uh, if the uh, uh, dew point and the ambient temperature get too close together, then they sh just shut them down. So yeah, I'll, yeah. So no, the, 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 for, the, for, the, for, the 48 inches is exactly the same. So when, I mean, yes, we do shut down um, or we're shut down by the 200 inch when they think the conditions are not suitable for observing. Um, but I think um, we are more internally sealed up and such that, you know, maybe there are, there's a wider range where we could potentially observe than we currently do. Well, Professor Graham, thank you very much for your time. Can I, I'm fine. can I, conclude with one question that kind of go, goes back to a point you made a few minutes ago. Um, you know, you said that CTF is a stepping stone to LSST and you've touched on parts of this, but could you summarize what, as you see it, what's the likely role of ZTF, will the role of ZTF change when science operations begin at the Rubin Observatory? Um, for some things, yes. I think for other things, no. Um, firstly, LSST is in the south, and we don't have, you know, the 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 the, the, the transient surveys in the north will still largely be driven by ZTF. So that's one of the advantages. Um, we also have, by the time LSST comes online, we will have six or seven years of baseline data, which we can build on. Um, they obviously can do that to some extent, but they're going to have to be uh, building their own setup as they go forward. And so um, they'll have to figure out either how to incorporate ZTF data with their own data or just rely on their own data going forward. Whereas we'll be building on um, you know, the legacy stuff that we've built up very nicely. Um, I think um, one, of the, one, of the big, one of the big issues is this whole idea of spectroscopic follow-up. And um, already just with, you know, we're trying to chase, we're trying to produce 3000 supernova a year, spectroscopically confirmed. And that's incredibly difficult using all the available resources in the astronomical community today. Um, and that's just going down to 20.5 or, or 19th magnitude, 20th magnitude as, your, as your, your limit. When you're chasing things down at 25th, 26th magnitude that you've detected, how do you possibly follow that up with ground or even space-based uh -huh. telescopes? Um, so I think, you know, um, there will be some very exciting discoveries made by LSST. I think there will be uh, some very interesting applications of advanced techniques um, to figure out what's going on. But in terms of what drives bread and butter observing with small to medium sized observatories and facilities, um, certainly in the Northern hemisphere, ZTF um, has a very clear role, I think, in that, in that arena. Well, very good. And sir, I have one, one more question. Uh, perhaps you said it at okay. the beginning, but I don't recall uh, what you said, what, what fraction of time on the other telescopes, the 60 inch and the 200 inch on Palomar Mountain is spent following up on discoveries made at ZTF? So on the 60 inch, it's 100%. Oh, really? On the, on the 200 inch, and, but the 60 inch is, uh, is fully robotic with this um, um, IFU on it, the, the, the SEDM IFU. Um, and we actually have um, a second SEDM setup that's coming on one of the telescopes on the 88 inch at uh, Kitt Peak, which will be taking some of the load off the, the 60 inch in that regard. 
On the 200 inch, um, we apply the time as all Caltech observers do through the, the Palomar Telescope Allocation Committee. Um, but we tend to be fairly successful because we've just got so much that we can potentially observe and follow up. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, ZTF saturates at 13th, 12th magnitude. So it, it discovers there are some bright things it discovers which you can follow up with much smaller telescopes quite happily. Well, thank you very much. I think that was a wonderful presentation. Right, thanks. A very good discussion. Uh, there are no further questions. Let me conclude with a word about our next meeting. On Saturday, August 14th, Dr. Stephen Kahn, director of the Vera Rubin Observatory, <clears throat> and Cassius Lamb Kirk Professor in the Natural Sciences at Stanford will be here to talk about the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, LSST, and the Simone Survey Telescope. According to one Caltech website, ZTF is laying the groundwork for the large synoptic Survey Telescope, now the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. On August 14th, Dr. Khan will tell us about this next important step in the development of time domain astronomy. So thank you again to Dr. Grant and my thanks as well to all of you for attending and supporting the Greenway Talks online Thank you very much. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Have a good weekend, all of you. Bye. Have a good weekend. Good.